Welcome to The Idea Space, a podcast devoted to sharing strategies and tools to help you make your dream life possible. I'm your host, Jen Liddy, a teacher turned entrepreneur. It's my mission to help women grow their businesses and get what they want without feeling guilty, overwhelmed, or confused. If you're tired of your ideas spinning around your mind and you really want something more for yourself, you're in the right place. Learn how to create the space to make your ideas a reality. I promise if I can do this, anyone can. Let's go. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Idea Space Podcast. I am your host, Jen Liddy, and this month in September 2020, I am talking about trying to normalize the things that we are feeling and dealing with so that we can realize that we're not alone, and that means we'll be able to move forward more easily. And I have to tell you the story of something that happened to me. I was watching TikTok, which is where you kind of just scroll on these videos of people you don't even know. I find it highly entertaining. And there was one guy who came on. It was like he was pretending that it was New Year's Eve 2020. And the piece of people on TikTok like stage these skits and it's, it's usually very entertaining. And so the skit was that it's New Year's Eve 2020 and they're doing the countdown and he keeps going to the digital clock and it says 1159 and then they're counting down 10, 9 and they get to 3, 2, 1 and the clock changes over to from 1159 to 1160. And this whole thing comes up on the screen, like 2020 will be continuing until we figure out blah, 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 blah. And it was like, oh my God, I had this moment of like my stomach fell. Like I, it was a really weird and silly reaction to this very stupid skit. But I was like, I am really looking forward to getting out of 2020. Like I am really at a place where I can't imagine that this just would keep continuing and go on and on and on because right now it just feels endless. And I realized I was thinking about like, what was this feeling that I was having? And I realized it's a sense of grief that I'm exhausted by it. I'm, I'm saddened by it. I'm angry about it. I'm hurt. I'm fearful. I don't know what's coming next. None of us do. Right. And so this idea of 2020, just continuing on into whatever the hell, you know, whatever that comes next for us really sent me into this mental spiral. And I just really felt it in my body. And so I was like, I needed to check this out. And so I, you know, I did some journaling, I did some thinking, I did some meditating on this and I realized, okay, this is grief. Now, My guess is that somewhere in your life, you're feeling a grief to a loss of something, a loss of normalcy, perhaps a, perhaps a loss of a person in your life. Maybe you're missing, you know, being around people. Maybe you're missing the normalcy of what would be happening normally this time of year. It's September. Things generally feel like they're starting again in September. So my guess is that you are feeling a grief of some sort. And so that is why I'm sharing with you an interview that I did back in April with a friend and client of mine, Jess Ryan. Jess has done a lot. She just is a life coach and she's done many trainings and she speaks so clearly and beautifully about grief and why we are experiencing grief, how we can move through it, what to do with it. And at the time when I published that, interview, it was so helpful to people. So I feel like now is the perfect time to bring it to my podcast audience because you may be experiencing grief in some way. And I want you to understand it and honor it and have some tools to help you move through it so that you stop either judging yourself about it or being wiped out about it. It's so important. So I'm going to leave it to you now, this amazing interview with Jess. It was really a wonderful interview to do, and I'm so grateful to her. And if you have any questions, you can always email me at jen underscore liddy at me.com, and I can put you in touch with Jess directly. And if grief is something that after this podcast, you realize you're really struggling with, there's so many resources out there. So please do find something that can help you beyond this podcast, if that's what you need. Okay. I will see you on the other side of the interview. And I hope that this is helpful for you. Good morning. Welcome to Miraculously Realistic Tools. Today, I've invited my friend and colleague, longtime friend, actually, Jess Bryan on to talk about the problem that I'm seeing, which is a lot of women have these emotions. They have a feeling and they actually can't put a name to it. And I've been recognizing it 
over and over again, but I'm not an expert in what it is. But Jess Ryan has been trained in this, and it's all about grief. And we often equate grief with death or big, big, big traumas. And the reason I asked Jess to come on is because I know that what we're dealing with is bringing up our grief. So Jess, I want to say thank you for coming today. And what can you teach us to help us with these feelings that we can't quite name? Yeah, thank you for having me on. I I really appreciate it. And I'm glad to share. Basically, you know, what does grief have to do with it other than the obvious people who are losing loved ones to this pandemic? Well, any kind of change that happens in our life is going to cause some kind of grief. And, you know, we usually don't think about it that way. But anytime we have change in our life, we lose things. So I thought it would be interesting to just talk quickly about something called the change cycle. You might have heard of it. Dr. Martha Beck came up with it and I learned it back in 2008 when I did coach training. But basically all change that happens to us is different, right? The circumstances are different. How we handle it is different. How we feel is different. But she found that all change kind of goes through this cycle. And she compares it to the metamorphosis of a butterfly. So it's really kind of interesting. So I wanted to just show the four squares or or phases of this cycle because we happen to be stuck in one of them. So first you can see that there's a catalyst happening on this side. So this is a, a catalytic event. And this can be something that happens to us and it can be considered good or bad, like a a death in the family or loss of a job, or it can be something that maybe we've been waiting to happen. Like we get our dream job in Japan and so we're going to be able to move there, but you have to move there in two weeks. So this is still going to upheave and cause change and it's going to cause loss, even though it's something good that has happened to us. Or the change can come from bubbling from within. These changes can kind of be hard to handle because it can be something that you realize after a while you're not really living a life that's in alignment with who you are and your values. And all of a sudden, um, a husband can go tell a wife or vice versa, I'm sorry, I don't love you anymore. Or you decide to leave your high paying corporate job to go sell bedazzled flip flops on the beach or something. And so you're probably going to get a lot of pushback from your friends and family. Like, why did she leave him? He's such a great man or, you know, but so any kind of change is, is going to in square one, it's called the death of identity because we're going to lose parts of ourselves. We're going to lose parts of who we are. And then square two is when we're kind of coming out of that we start to dream and scheme again. So our creativity comes back. We start to laugh again. We start to think about what could this part of my life look like now that it's going to be different. And then we move into the hero's journey, which is making whatever we came up with in our dreaming and scheming happen. So we're we're doing in that part. And then the promised land is kind of where everything in that aspect of your life is pretty good and you're you're tweaking it, but it's going along. So today I'm just going to focus on square one because that's where we're all stuck. We're all stuck in square one. So I have a question about square one. So this could look like, yes, I have somebody who I've lost to coronavirus or my business has gone under, but it could also look like I realize my son or daughter isn't actually going to have a graduation. Absolutely. Yes. I realize not, you know, something catastrophic, like I'm stuck in the house with my family and I realize I have completely lost my own identity. It could be something catastrophic, but it could also be something not necessarily catastrophic, right? And so yes. that I think is something people don't understand about grief, that it doesn't necessarily have to be catastrophic to the outside world. Absolutely. And that's a great segue into what I was going to say, because I just want to highlight three ways that the change that we're undergoing right now is different than the change that normally we find ourselves in the change cycle. because. The change cycle, we're going through different areas of our life, right? And it's just the typical stuff that's happening to us every day. Change is inevitable. But usually when change happens to us, it's in one or maybe a few areas. Like, for example, you lose your job and maybe you're devastated over that, but you have a real stable marriage and you have a community and a family who supports you. So that part of your life is pretty good. So it's usually just in in one or a few areas. The second thing is, like you mentioned, it's usually not catastrophic. It can be. It can be traumatic and catastrophic, of course, but 
the change we usually go through is not generally. And then this is an important one is usually it's just us that's going through it, or maybe our family, if it's the loss of a loved one, or maybe it could even be regional if it's something like a tornado or something. Okay. So we're not going through it with everyone else going through it. We're going through it. You know. So I'm sure this is occurring to you, right? As I'm saying this, so that with this pandemic, it's not just one area of our life that's being upheaved. It's right. everything. I mean, I can't think of one area of my life that has not been turned upside mm-hmm. down. And It's traumatic. It's traumatic for everyone to varying degrees. And not only is it traumatic, but it's ongoing. So it's not like a traumatic event occurred. And then, you know, okay, now we have to pick up the pieces and start to move forward. This is still happening to us. I never thought about that part of it. (laughs) I get that it's traumatic, but a traumatic event occurs and then is over, like a death, an accident, an illness, like you get the diagnosis and then you move on to figure out. Yes. What is the area between heaven and hell? called where you're just purgatory purgatory, (laughs) yes and then the third one is it's happening to the whole damn world yeah okay so it's you know i think we're doing a great job supporting each other but we're all going through this so it's not like you know if you have a death in the family someone sets up a meal train for you and and, you know somebody takes care of your kids for you or if there is a tornado in one state the neighboring states come to the aid you know Mm -hmm. We're all kind of like, we're looking for someone to be, you know, who's going to help us. And we wish we had someone in charge who would really (laughs) help us and lead us. But, you know, so that's like three really important ways that, that this has never happened before in our lifetimes, you know, this level of change. So we're grieving a lot of things. And like you said, our culture teaches us that there's only one kind of grief. So I think a lot of people, when they heard grief, they said, well, thank God, I don't have a loved one who has been taken by coronavirus. What do you mean that I'm grieving? You know, but there's actually many, many different types of grief. There's bereavement, which is losing someone. There's traumatic grief, which you have when you have a traumatic event occur to you. There's secondary grief, which is when you witness a trauma, or even you don't even have to witness it. You can read about it or hear about it. And you can actually have trauma and grief surrounding that. There's disenfranchised grief, which is grief that is not acceptable by society. And a great example of that is when women lose a pregnancy. It's not really something that they're supposed to talk about, right? right? right. And it's also something that Maybe some people even think, well, how far along was she? Only a month. It's not really that big of a deal when it is the complete opposite. You know, this is grieving a child. So disenfranchised grief is difficult because, you know, you're just not supposed to be feeling that way. And I think that we're, I'm going to come back to this, but I think we're putting that on ourselves that we think our grief is disenfranchised. Yeah. Then there's cumulative grief. And we all know people who tend to have like one bad thing happen to them after another. And you're like, well, why do they get so unlucky? You know, so they're just getting piled on. Two more kinds I want to mention. One is anticipatory grief. Now, this you might think of if you have a loved one, say, in hospice, and you know that they're going to die. You're anticipating that loss, but it hasn't happened yet. So that's an anticipatory and prolonged grief, which I have to mention because this is for people who have lived in poverty. This is for people who experience racism every single day of their lives. Okay. And they're just constantly in grief because it's hitting them every day. It's integrated into their lives. Like systemic. Systemic. Okay. So if you think about all of these that I just mentioned... We're, we're having all of these too. Yeah. You know, the, the grief is prolonged. It's cumulative. We are anticipating. We know that more bad stuff is probably going to happen, but we don't really know what it is. Right, right. So it's scary, right? Like we're seeing all these stories. So secondary grief about horrific stories about doctors and nurses dying, right. residents right. dying. So basically we're all just stuck knee deep in square one (laughs) in grief and trauma and trauma and so once we i was going to mention that go ahead sorry no no no, go ahead martha beck compares the change cycle to metamorphosis of a butterfly square one is when the caterpillar builds the chrysalis around itself and then melts down 
Mm-hmm. So what happens is their cells are literally like becoming this mass of goo. Right. They're no longer a caterpillar, but they're not yet a butterfly. And I, I was thinking, God, that's exactly how I feel. Like, I just don't <laughs> even know what the hell's going on. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I am. And I think we're all kind of feeling that way. So that's pretty much the feeling of square one. And the motto of square one is, <laughs> I don't know what the hell is going on. And that's okay. So that's what we kind of need to keep telling ourselves. So we have Catherine who's watching. She said anticipatory grief is big in this particular situation. A lot of people are very worried about how their loved ones are doing, especially if they can't be near them right now. And then I'm thinking about people who are anticipating, like, say, if you have a bar or a restaurant and you've been shut down and you're doing the best you can, but you have no idea if your business is going to open back up. That's like an anticipatory grief. So a lot of people are feeling this right now. So you said the motto of being here is nobody knows what's happening and that's okay. Yeah, I don't know what the hell's going on, and that's okay. Okay, great. <laughs> so it may not feel okay, but it's I okay. feel like this conversation is so helpful for people who haven't quite been able to put the label on themselves that, oh, I this is grief. This is what I'm feeling with. So once we're able to say, Oh, I get it, I get the framework, I get that this is grief, where do they go with that? What do you do with that? Yeah, I mean, I I think you. I just want to emphasize what you said because it is so important to acknowledge that it's grief. Because I mean, one thing with anxiety is anxiety feeds on itself, especially if you don't understand that you're experiencing anxiety, right? Because you're starting to panic and get sweaty, and you're starting to freak out with your thoughts, and you're and if you don't understand that you're experiencing anxiety. You're like, what the hell is going on? I'm going to die, you know? And then that feeds into more anxiety. So even just knowing and understanding that you're going through grief is going to be helpful to you because you can say, oh, that's what's happening here. You know, oh, that's normal. And so one thing that we can do is allow all of our feelings in any order at any time because we are that melted down caterpillar right now. And so it's so important to feel our feelings fully because we want to stuff them because it's hard and scary to feel the feelings. But I like to think of someone told me this once, like you're standing in the ocean and maybe the water is up to like your waist or your chest and the waves are coming in and the waves are those emotions. And if you stand there with your arms out trying to stop them from coming, <laughs> that's not going to happen, right? They're going right. to knock you on your butt, you know? So if you just pick your feet up and float, the wave will pick mm. you up and you'll it'll wash over you. And I don't know if you heard of Jill Bolte Taylor. She's no. the she's the neurologist who had a stroke and she was actually aware oh, while she was having story. it. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So she wrote a book about that. She found that there's actually a psychological lifespan of emotions and that the emotion will naturally peak and dissipate in your body within 90 seconds. Martha Beck talks about this. My coach says the same thing. Yeah. My coach says the same thing. A lot of people don't believe it though. I know because sometimes when you're experiencing a really strong emotion, like grief, you feel like you're going to die. You really do. Like your body, your mind is telling you that this emotion is going to kill you. And it's, it's obviously not, but it will, if you let it wash over you, it could, it's probably going to feel like the worst 90 seconds of your life, but it will wash and, and it will come back too. you know, like it, yeah, it's not yeah, like, the other thing. yeah, it's there's going to be done kind of situation. <laughs> right, right. Hopefully it's going to be less in intensity as time goes on, but it will. So the other thing I wanted to mention, because this is the most important thing that I learned in my grief certification is that I'm sure everyone has heard about the five stages of grief, right? Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and you know, their denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So actually, she came up with those for terminally ill people, terminally ill patients. So these were feelings like she did studies, and she actually contributed so much to hospice and in the field of helping people who know that they're dying, who are terminal. But it was not, never meant to be adopted by our society like it was as a grief formula. So 
we've taken it and said, well, I'm supposed to grieve in this order, in these steps. And if I don't do that, I'm wrong and I should be ashamed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you might you might swirl around all five of them in some different order or you might not have some of those experiences. 100%. It is random. She never meant to say that when someone experiences grief, they're going to go through in this order only and never go back to the prior step. And in fact, people who are kind of continuing her work with the blessing of her family, mm -hmm. they have been given permission to add a sixth stage, which is meaning. What does that mean? So when something happens and you lose something, making meaning of it, making some kind of like, we always as humans want to make meaning out of everything. And so I think some people have even started to talk about, well, what can this mean for me, this experience being isolated and quarantined? How am I going to take the things that I've learned from that and that I like from that and carry them forward, hopefully into my life? Once we are not trapped in our houses anymore, you know, does, make, does making meaning always mean it's a positive thing? Like, are there people who would make meaning in a negative way? Like this means I can never love again. This means I can never trust again. This means are there people who do that? Oh, definitely. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely people who if they aren't able to process their emotions of grief, they're living in a situation where they can't because they, they're unsafe or they are still having trauma happen to them. Or if they just don't want to because it's too hard, mm -hmm. they don't have the support they need. Yeah, you, know, you definitely are probably going to come out of it saying that the worst thing that ever happened in your life. Right, and, right. And, I, and I'm also want to make clear, I'm not saying what some people say when someone dies, like, well, this was for the best, uh -huh. or, you know, this is what was meant to be like, people don't want to hear that when they're grieving. Right, it's right. not really, that's not what I'm saying. Everybody can make their own meaning out of it. And it doesn't mean that it was the best thing that happened to you. It just means what are you going to take from it and use to make your life better? You know? Okay. So Ultimately, what I'm hearing from you is the most important thing to understand about grief is it's highly personal. No yes. one can judge it. So if I don't know if I can talk about this without crying, but when I was a kid, like I felt like we didn't have a lot and I grieved that like I really wanted more and nobody ever told me that it was okay to want more. Like it's okay to grieve what you don't have. It's okay to want more. And so now with my son being 13, not being in school, having lost like so many things that we were supposed to do and an amazing birthday trip he was supposed to have, I really mm. wanted him to know that it was okay to grieve it, even though it's silly and it's a privilege, right, that he had to give up. Uh, but it was still okay for him to grieve that. And yeah. I think that one of the things that we can do for our children, for our families, our friends and ourselves is say... You don't have to judge the thing you're grieving. It might feel superfluous or silly or stupid to somebody else, but to you, it matters. And that's what I keep hearing you say. It's very personal. That's right. And you hit on something that's so important, which is there is this thing called the hierarchy of grief okay. where we can try to make our grief more or less than someone else's. Um, and Back to the, you know, the example of the disenfranchised grief with miscarrying a baby. I, like I said, some people will ask, well, how far along were you? As if the further along you were, the worse it is. So we just want to take our grief and, and put it in comparison to somebody else's. So that was kind of my second tip, which is don't compare and despair your grief. Mm -hmm. You know, don't compare your grief to someone else's because, yes, I mean, I am, I certainly know that I am in a very lucky position, right? Like my husband still has his job. He's still making money. I have a safe place to be. I'm not living in a domestic violence situation trapped in my house with an abusive person. I have money to feed my family. I have health care. So many people don't have those basic right. rights. So we can easily start to feel like, well, what, what am I complaining about? Right? Like I shouldn't feel bad because, you know, these other people have it so much worse. And then we're denying our own grief and our own feelings. 
But all that does is paralyze us. Kind of like and, a version of stuffing it down, like you were talking about before. Yes. This is a stuffing it. It's a stuffing it. And the point is, it doesn't put us in a position to help those people, right? right? It puts us in a position of more ruminating on how horrible I am for feeling bad when these other people are feeling worse. Instead, if we allow ourselves to feel those feelings and process them, we can move forward and figure out how we can help the people in that situation. Right. So clearing of the brain, when you let yourself process the emotions, you're not coming from fear or lack anymore. And then your brain can be creative to say, okay, how can I help? Yes. And none of us want to be selfish, right? So I think we're thinking it's so selfish of me to, you know, feel this way when so many people are suffering, when it's actually selfish to not allow yourself to feel that way, because then you're not helping anybody. So if we can twist it around like that, that usually helps a lot of people kind of be like, oh, I I don't want to be selfish. (laughs) It's like uh, stuck people can't help stuck people. So right. if you remain stuck in your own and you're stuck because you feel so guilty and you're grief ridden about that, then that keeps you stuck and you can't help other people who are stuck. Right. Just yeah. such good, good stuff. You're so brilliant about this. <laughs> yeah. Like you, the way that you speak about it is just so logical and loving. So thank you so much for this information because I think it's really helpful. You taught us to name it and see it. And then Mika is saying, be as good to ourselves as we are to others. And we yes. can't do that if we're mired down in our own grief. Thank you, Nika, for that. Just yes. how can people get into your world and get help from you if they are feeling grief or they're not sure what they're feeling is grief? How can people connect with you? Yeah, well, I'm going to be offering some pay what you can sessions. And I think you mentioned in the beginning, I am like a parenting coach. So that's my specialty, but I'm happy to talk to anybody who's, you know, confused about what they're feeling or think they're feeling grief. So I'm going to be adding in the comments. You said there, I could add to the comments in this anytime recording. Today. Yeah, or anytime at all. Like you can just add to the comments how people can get in touch with you. Yeah. So I'm going to add that. Um, I'm going to add a link to a scheduler where people can go to and just schedule a time to talk because I think a lot of people don't have anybody to kind of work this through. And it's, in my experience, after I talk to somebody, you know, it just makes all the difference in the world to calm me down and and help me just get grounded again. So, yes. And I can speak specifically, I've worked with Jess in the past and she helped me through a very hard time in my life about five or six years ago now. I can't believe it. (laughs) It doesn't even feel like that long ago. I know. But I, I know that Jess is highly trained, highly empathic, and really can help you. So please reach out to her. Jess, thank you so much for your expertise and your time today. You don't know how much I appreciate it. And I think thank other you. people will appreciate just having a word to put on right. how they're feeling. Like, oh, right. that's what this is. Yes, that's what this craziness is. It's yeah. great. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the Idea Space in your podcast app and tell that friend of yours who needs some help getting where she wants to go. I'd be so appreciative if you left a review because then we can help more women create the space for their ideas too. Go to jenliddy.com forward slash free to grab the many free resources there to help you move forward. And I will see you next time. Bye.